At one point, a ways back, in a moment of absolute madness, I briefly flirted with the ridiculous notion of reviewing Overwatch 2. I say ridiculous because me reviewing Overwatch 2 is a ludicrous concept on so many levels based on my personal video game qualifications alone. My reflexes were shot to shit over a decade ago, and even then they were appalling, and that's when I wasn't shit based drunk. On top of that, I don't even know how Overwatch 1 works. I played it for about two hours, and just thought it looked like someone had put a bunch of characters from a kids cartoon into a bag of Skittles, poured in a can of energy drink, mashed it all together, and then very, very aggressively thrown it at a computer monitor as hard as is humanly possible. I don't understand this game. I don't know how to play it. And it is actually quite titillating the degree to which I have no fucks to give about any of this. I'll be Bastion. Nerf Bastion. You're right to Winston. I wanna be Winston. I guess I'll be Genji. I'm already Genji. Then I'll be McCree. I already chose McCree. I'll be Tracer. I'm already Tracer. No! I'm Tracer! You stupid bitch! There are also, however, many objective reasons why I decided not to review Overwatch 2. Reasons that became instantly obvious the second I started to sniff around its skirt. It's obviously horribly shit. It only exists so they can steal back all your microtransactions from the first game and make you buy them all over again. They paid off reviewers. Don't believe me? Check this. And just in case you missed this part, I'll say it again. Reviewers said it's great. But players are losing their shit. The game nibbles the hairs out of a dead dog's ass crack, and nobody needs me to make a video explaining why playing Overwatch 2 is a very stupid thing to do indeed. To dwell on the Metacritic aspect for a moment, and why I am starting to seethe at the mainstream review industry, I should mention this. Now Metacritic has bent the knee to its corporate overlords and banned launch day reviews. They have basically created a minimum 36 hour bullshit window, where paid scumlording shillfucks can bullshit about how good the game is. And the paying members of the public who are bankrolling this game are banned from warning anyone that the game is a shit show. Whilst everyone who doesn't know any better is looking at the Metacritic score for up to two days, thinking, it must be good, because all of those cretins at mainstream publishers said so. Now if there's two things I hate, it's hyperbole, and the fact that everyone who works in video game marketing deserves to be dragged up in front of the International Court of Human Rights and treated as justly as the Nazis at the Nuremberg war crimes trials. But this particular shitshow with Overwatch 2 is actually worse than it initially appears, because by not allowing anyone to post a user review until two days after launch, that means that people who have played the beta and know prior to launch that it's a stinking fuckpile can't even share their views, read warnings, until after all the pre-orders have been processed, launch day sales have been made, all the games have been launched, and everyone has voided their rights to refund the game. This is the stinking shields at Metacritic, kowtowing to corporations like little snivelling obsequious dogs, and in order to please the Darth Vaders of this world, they have sold everyone out and created a window of diplomatic immunity for publishers to lie all the way through the launch publicity cycle until days after the game is out there in the world, doing what it does best. Which in this case is… being shit. And this is an important legal and ethical Rubicon they have crossed. Metacritic claims to be a review aggregating site, but if they are censoring and curating reviews and banning user reviews during the launch window altogether, well now they are actually a marketing site. But the single biggest reason that I did not play Overwatch 2 was simply this. Initially, they would not even let me install it without providing them with my contract mobile phone number. I beg your fucking pardon? Having been a Blizzard customer for many, many years on multiple accounts and having spent a lot of money, these shit stains turned around and said, you can't play this game until you provide us with a mobile phone number 
contractually linked to your credit rating and your home address. Because we don't fucking trust you. Well, fuck these guys with a pogo stick. Just imagine the hubris of posting that kind of message to someone on the same account they've been spending money on for many years. Now, it appears that for now, they have partially relented and backed down due to the vociferous and righteous public fury, so now players with existing ActiBlizz accounts can play it. But new players still need to provide a mobile phone number. But the critical point is, they tried to get away with this shit. They will no doubt try and force this situation onto us by other means, and on other occasions. Then, I found out they were trying to pull the exact same stunt in Modern Warfare 2. And at this point I sat there and thought, okay, what the precise actual fuck is going on here? Why in God's name would they be trying to force something on the customers that they know will exclude lots of players, piss off the rest, and almost certainly cause a backlash? Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones. Got a phone. right? Much of this video will admittedly be conjecture about the industry motives, based primarily on deduction and known trends in gaming. So yes, there will be a lot of speculation. But I've said all kinds of crazy stuff in the past too, like microtransactions and paid progress would become normalised, that paid content would become normalised, that player surveillance would become normalised, that companies are willfully trying to turn video games into casinos. So if anything I say in this video sounds like futurology or wild predictions, well, it might well be. But all I do is look at the evil shit they did, the evil shit they are doing now, and draw a line between those two dots in order to map the trajectory of the evil shit that they're going to be doing in the future. It's a hell of a lot easier than rocket science. Sounds simple. It totally fucking is. And sadly, I've frequently been right. And most importantly, it's not like I can see into the future. It's because the relentless march of amoral greed is predictable, systematic, and largely telegraphed years in advance if you watch the right trade videos. So what the actual fuck is going on with Overwatch 2 and Modern Warfare 2 SMS Protect? So let's deal with the hard facts first. Basically, Activision was insisting that all PC players, even long-standing players who have been signed up for years, need to supply their contract mobile number in order to play Overwatch 2. And they plan on pulling the exact same stunt with the next Call of Duty game as well. I guess it's PC players only, because if you play Xbox or PlayStation via the associated online accounts, you are already hardwired into Skynet. And they probably have easier access to your console and personal information than you do. It is also significant that it must be a contract mobile, not a pay as you go. And I think that this is highly significant, because I personally don't believe this bullshit PR that the system only works on contract phones. When we try and send text messages to pay as you go mobiles, the computer gets discombobulated and starts to cry and everything breaks and smoke comes out the back. Look, it's not hard to send an automated text message to a pay-as-you-go phone, and anyone at Activision trying to claim that IT compatibility is the issue is bullshitting us. Banks can do it. Online stores can do it. Everyone can do it. But apparently Activision Blizzard's entire infrastructure pisses the bed and catches fire the very second anyone tries to connect a pay-as-you-go phone. Sorry, I'm not buying it. They are trying to demand that you very specifically connect your contract mobile to your player account. Not your prepaid, but your actual legal contract mobile phone that is linked to you, as in, you will be forced to link your real, personal, legal, offline identity with your game account. That's the key point here. They want a phone where you signed a credit-checked contract with your personal details. 
SMS Protect also incorporates a new Activision technology euphemistically called Klaus Schwab's Wet Dream, I mean Defense Matrix. Defense Matrix is possibly one of the most horrible things I've ever seen in video games, and I've seen a lot of horrible things. And for once, that was not hyperbole. The more I read about it, the more I kept thinking about the Chinese social credit system. Now personally, I used to like the idea of automatic bots instantly kicking people out of the game if they held tirades of racist abuse at people. I have zero problem if someone running around screeching, take all the gypsies to gas chambers and kill them, gets summarily kicked out of the game and given a seven day timeout. In more innocent times, a little automated voice recognition on VoIP actually seemed like a good idea. Before the age of... The Message. However, on further thought, the problem is, who gets to decide the banned words, and what exactly comes bundled with the voice recognition technology? How naive I was to think that this was a good idea, and that it wouldn't be abused. Instead of just suggesting people develop thick skin, or turn their fucking voice comms off, if nasty words hurt their fifis. The problem is that Defence Matrix goes a little farther than just real-time voice recognition, and Defence Matrix is intimately integrated into SMS Protect. Thanks to your contract mobile phone number, Defence Matrix links your legal identity to their database, then AI bots will conduct voice recognition on your in-game conversations, some of which will be transcribed automatically into text and stored against your account. Now they're claiming it won't happen unless you report it. They're claiming that recordings will only be transcribed and kept for a little while. But Amazon promised me Alexa doesn't spy on people. Then it turned out it records everything you fucking say. IT consultants admitted to sitting at their desks listening to randos, personal conversations and going through their chat logs. It was all a lie. Obviously they promised they fixed that now. But that might be a lie too. My mobile phone company said my mobile phone is secure and not only can your mic and your geolocation be turned on remotely, but sadly, if you've installed pretty much any app at all, you probably already gave them permission to access everything stored on your phone. Access to the mic, access to your camera, and access to those filthy nude pics you've been sending to your babysitter. Big corporations routinely say soothing words to quell your fears, because it helps sales and stock price. Then routinely do precisely the shit they promised wouldn't happen, and then say, Sorry, sugar is good for you, tobacco is good for you, weed oil is good for you, insects are good for you, everything is good for you, until it's not. Then they say, sorry. The big problem here is the identification and consolidation of your data as a supposed anonymous gamer. Because we should be able to drop a few bucks on a video game, play for a few hours and not enter into an egregious legal contract, whilst shitting all of our personal details out onto the internet. The plan here is this. They want to take your IP, gamer tags, game accounts, chat logs, psychometric data profile, spending profile and whatever social media you might have linked to your accounts via giveaways, competitions and information that you gave them voluntarily linking stuff during these promotion exercises. Then they want to wrap this all neatly up, put it in a file and thanks to you providing your contractual phone contact details, now they can also file it all under your singular, legal, real identity. Because if you provide your real contract phone number, you are no longer hard to trace. There are many ways to do it without breaking the law, and many companies dedicated to linking cell phones to people. I'm quietly confident that Activision can hook that shit up fairly quickly. They just need to hire an agency to do it, for a nominal fee. Bobby Kotick, by his own admission, claims he's powerful enough to have a staff member assassinated, so I reckon it shouldn't be too hard for him to trace a few mobile numbers. Now before we start gnawing on the sinew and gristle of this corpse, I think we need to discuss a little history, by looking at the backstory of online privacy and the litany of data breaches and abuses of big tech. Now maybe I'm connecting too many dots here, and I would be the first to admit that I am hugely biased when it comes to looking at the behaviour of video game publishers through the worst possible lens. But in my defence, 
That is because they frequently behave like fucking scum, and they are currently under investigation and legal review in every country in the world, developed enough to have a transport system, and toilets where you can actually sit down to take a shit. And anyone who has seen my video about comparing video game monetization strategies with big tobacco will know exactly where I stand on this whole matter. They are doing very, very bad things with your data, and they are refusing requests for disclosure, at best, and lying at worst. But even acknowledging that I'm a fully paid up proud tinfoil hat wearing cynic, PC users have been happily playing video games and minding their own fucking businesses, often logging in anonymously, for decades. But this year, this year, suddenly they don't think we should be allowed to do that anymore, and they want our fucking contractual legal IDs in order to play. I don't know about you, but I smell a rat. I don't believe these guys for a second, and I don't believe them for a very simple reason. Every other time they pull some outrageous stunt on their customers, they say it's for one reason, and it always ends up being for something else. So I want to work out the following. 1. I want to show that they are full of shit. And 2. Figure out some likely scenarios of what they're really doing here. Because it certainly looks like they're creating a database of online profiles which they are verifying against your real legal identity and registered home address. They are combining this with Defence Matrix, a system that monitors your conversations, uses chat logs and voice recognition. They're going to be keeping records, there is no legal accountability for the customer, no right to be forgotten, and I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that it will be combined with or attached to all the other data they harvest from you as a player, such as spending habits and player engagement. Because just in case you didn't get the memo, online video game publishers are collecting data points on you in the exact same way that Facebook and Google are, only with even less transparency. Now I first smelled a rat when Ubisoft updated their end user license agreement. They formalised your legal requirement to give your full honest name and details, and they contractualised that, stating that you were in breach of contract if you did not give them all your personal information. That was odd. Well now it appears Activision Blizzard is upping the ante and demanding that via your mobile phone you provide legal proof too. Only now they're combining it with Defence Matrix, a system that monitors the shit you say in game, and if someone reports you, or the system just recognises a word you say, you might get flagged for some random hate crime. And hate crime is a very loose and liberally applied term these days. Let's not ignore the real world context here, irrespective of your personal political stance or lack thereof, if you merely believe in democracy prevailing over tyranny, then consider this. Right now the incumbent President of the United States, Potatus if you will, has just declared half of the US electorate as fascists. The FBI is categorising homesteaders and preppers as potential domestic terrorists. Police are arresting mothers in their homes because trans activists made up some stories and nobody bothered to check the details before they went round and arrested her on her doorstep. And journalists are having their doors kicked in at gunpoint because they… well, because they didn't do anything wrong at all. We are living in an age where if you grow your own carrots, do a bit of journalism, store three weeks of food in the pantry, or voted for that funny looking fella with the comb over, or literally did nothing wrong at all. That might be sufficient to get you arrested. In this current climate, do you really want your video game publisher creating a database on you with a mobile phone number linking your legal identity where some blue haired progressive activist can scan through your chat history and casually report you for hate crimes? I don't know about you, but Activision Blizzard certainly appears to be laying the groundwork for what is best described as a video game social credit score system. Now at this point I'm sure fanboys and the terminally naive will be saying, they won't abuse the system, we can trust them with our information. 
there won't be mission creep. It's not like the video game publishers are bad people who abuse their power and do nasty things, right? Hmm. Look, we live in a world where if you do anything online, you can't trust anybody. We live in a world where spiteful, deranged, professional harassers and bullshitters like Taylor Lorenz takes issue with people's jokes, then allegedly contacts one of her mates who works at Twitter so she can magically get hold of libs of TikTok's account information so that she can then dox them, post horrific bullshit accusations about them and basically try and ruin their lives, incomes and future safety. I would say something mean about Granny Lorenz, but frankly, I'm not a fan of ad hominem attacks, so I will be the bigger man here. Besides, it wouldn't surprise me if being a narcissistic gaslighter who sociopathically doxes families on the internet whilst pulling faces reminiscent of a bag of angry fucking rats are probably protected characteristics these days. But do you really want to sign up to a situation where any angry little vengeful shit weasel who knows someone at a video game publisher's accounts department can spot your gamer tag, then contact their mate and find out exactly where you live? Because this is something that can happen, and I know this because it's already happened to one of my associates when they pissed off some snowflake developer during a live stream. She must have trundled down to the accounts department, pulled his gamer tag, checked his account, fabricated a complaint of sexual harassment, and then cops showed up at his door. Publishers have arbitrarily banned streamers just because their feelings were hurt. Publishers these days arbitrarily ban people for just pissing off their streamer shills or their devs when playing. They tried to destroy one guy for reporting on their own security flaws. Then we have the horrific legal abuses where publishers take offence to content creators and send in an army of lawyers. We probably all know of at least one content creator who mysteriously vanished overnight when the publishers sent a bunch of lawyers round their house to sue them for millions over some perceived slight. Video game publishers have a long legacy of using legal bullying and abusive censorship to silence critics and legitimate complaints too. Now, if a player says something annoying, like points out a security flaw, now that person can be blacklisted. And if Activision has its way, they'll be able to look up your mobile phone number on a database and they won't even have to hire a specialist security company to track you down and intimidate you. Sound extreme? Not really. They've done it before loads of times, and we probably only get to hear about a fraction of them thanks to a combination of intimidation and non-disclosure agreements. So I ask you, are these really the people you can trust with your personal data, chat logs and data points? I think it's worth briefly explaining a few principles about anti-cheat for the uninitiated, especially since video game publishers generally talk complete shit on the subject and misrepresent it in order to service their own lazy r slack cheapskate policies. Anti-cheat is best conceptualised as an arms race. Cheat and hack companies are huge. It's literally now a multi-million dollar sector of the illicit tech industry. The second a new game comes out, they have hacks for it. They have spies in the video game industry. They have huge budgets. They sneak into alpha and beta tests so they can start working on hacks before the game is even officially released. They know their shit. They have immense resources. They hire highly skilled guys. And they work fast. It's basically the opposite of Ubisoft Malmo. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, video game publishers largely don't give much of a fuck really. Plus, anti-cheat costs money. Money being spent on a problem that only negatively affects the customers. I mean, why spend money protecting customers from cheaters when you could spend that money on bribing reviewers, bribing YouTubers, or subsidising the lazy, work-shy fucking activists who spend months working on content for a video game and the best thing they can come up with is a non-binary character and a system where people get banned from the subreddit for misgendering it. Makes so much sense, right? They have so few fucks to give about anti-cheat that esports teams have been caught cheating in competitions live on air and they weren't even banned for life. 
Forget prosecuting them for fraud. Forget banned from competing ever again. Forget having their sponsorship deals stripped from them. They got caught fucking cheating. Get a ban of a few weeks or months, go home for a wank and a nap, shrug and come back to work. Imagine if a police officer got busted stealing $100,000 from a drugs bust and his punishment was two weeks off work without pay and a promise that he would return whatever cocaine he hadn't finished snorting yet. Time and time again, video game companies have voted with their feet and sent the very strong message that they professionally, wholeheartedly and financially do not care about cheating in video games. Cheat companies these days are so ahead of the game it's frankly impressive. They do weird shit with the code to inject it into your PC's memory or something like that. So it's not even like you can scan for it on someone's hard drive. Some cheats actually run off an external device like a Raspberry Pi connected to your PC, so it's entirely undetectable. They update these hacks on the fly, support it far better than the games themselves are being supported, and they generally know far more about cheating than publishers know about stopping cheating. I mean, the NSA hires ex-hackers to work in security. Anti-cheat companies should consider hiring some of these hackers to work on anti-cheat systems. Frankly, publishers should probably try and hire the whole of their customer service department because they shit all over most AAA publishers when it comes to customer satisfaction. And that last point, sadly, was not a joke. Like I said, anti-cheat is an arms race between companies who sell cheats and game publishers who sit around drinking coconut water and occasionally take it a few minutes out of their busy schedule of virtue signalling about equity to post something on Twitter about how they're working on the cheating problem. It's an arms race where the hackers are turning up in state-of-the-art stealth fighters and the video game publishers are turning up with a World War I gun carriage being pulled through the mud by a couple of knackered fucking pit ponies. So everyone needs to disabuse themselves of the notion that one, Publishers give a shit about anti-cheat, and two, anti-cheat is something equivalent to the moronic, dishonest and frankly horseshit statements that community managers and publishers routinely gaslight us about. You know, stuff like, don't worry guys, in the next update we'll be adding easy anti-cheat to the game and that will stop the cheating. It has never stopped the cheating, it just shaved a little bit off the top. If you honestly think that anti-cheat is something you can casually slap on a game as an afterthought and that will magically end cheating, then you are either fucking delusional or you have believed the lies. It just doesn't work that way. It's a PR lie, in the same way that slapping on a hard hat isn't going to protect you when someone drops an oil tanker on your fucking head. It's security theatre. Frankly, if you haven't considered anti-cheat at the development phase of a video game, the battle is most likely already been lost. Just like when games launch and player data is held client side, you've already fucked it. It doesn't matter what you do then, the game cannot be protected properly. That is why we have got to the point where apparently one third of Call of Duty players cheat. Because there is, was and has always been practically no will to stop it from happening. It's also worth noting that if video game publishers invested 10% of the effort in anti-cheat that they put into microscopically analysing people's engagement and spending behaviour, they would be able to spot cheats easily because of the anomalies and inconsistencies in their in-game actions. Headshot ratios, mouse and keyboard inputs, weird artefacts in their playstyle, machines don't act like humans and if they could be bothered, they could detect this shit reliably and in real time but they won't spend the money. I say all of this because you need to know that anti-cheaters is an arms race and most of what you read about it on the video game subreddit is almost exclusively PR statements. Because when someone says, it's okay guys, it's all fixed, we rolled out battle eye to stop the cheats, what they really mean is, okay, okay, we just bought a license for Battle Eye, which is going to cost us three pence per game. So can you please all shut the fuck up about the rampant and uncontrolled cheating and we're all going to pretend it's not going on just like before. 
And if someone says this six months after launch, then what they really mean is, lol you idiots, just let me piss down your backs while I tell you it's raining. It's also worth noting that there is certainly anecdotal evidence that a bit of bad cheating with easily detectable hacks, cheats and exploits can be good business for the publishers. Allegedly, a certain MMO, which will remain nameless out of respect for the gnomes and elves that play it, would deliberately let players continue to cheat for extended periods of time until they were fully engaged with the game, and then ban them in full knowledge that most of them would just trundle out and buy another copy of the game. Now I see the logic of not banning players immediately because it creates a real-time feedback loop so that anti-cheat companies can work out how they're getting caught. But doing ban waves every six months isn't really protecting the player experience of the people who are not cheating. The average player still has to exist in a world full of cheats, whilst the publisher lives in a world full of periodic ban waves, followed by lots of repeat purchases. So yes, when it comes to this particular arms race, the video game companies aren't just fucking losing. Most of the time, they're calling in sick. The entire premise of the SMS Protect and Defense Matrix data harvesting program is to stop cheating and end disruptive behavior. It's all about protecting the player experience and making it a nice safe space for everyone apparently. <laughs> and if you actually believe that, then you probably should prepare yourself for some bad news about Santa Claus, Flat Earth Theory and the rate of inflation. The publisher's claims just don't add up and I think we should take a long hard look at what has happened in the past just to illuminate how their alleged concerns are simply not a plausible justification for what they're trying to do. Anti-cheat. Video game publishers have demonstrated for decades that they don't give a fuck about that, despite their lofty claims. They spent many years hammering that point home like a £400 bedridden compulsive pie-eating shut-in the video game industry might say it's really concerned about its weight, but really we know they just want more pies. Because that's how we ended up here, in the current situation. Lots of greed, and zero will to act on the matter. During all the time I played video games, video game publishers only introduced anti-cheat as an afterthought, frequently just cutting a quick deal with Punk Buster or Easy Anti-Cheat or Battle Eye, just to give an illusion a gloss of security, like supplying a cheap bike lock in an area where the bike thieves drive around with fucking bolt cutters. It's security theatre. It's the illusion that there is some deterrence in place. Hilariously, some video games have even introduced skills and perks that imitate hacks to obscure the level of cheating from the player experience. All this serious and effective anti-cheat costs a lot of money and publishers just don't care enough to invest it. They do like to make a big song and dance, put on a show and claim they care, but that is PR. But if they cared, cheating would not have grown to the point where it's a multi-million dollar industry, because if it didn't work so well, they wouldn't be doing such great business. Look, Activision might be doing all of this for a whole load of reasons, but it certainly ain't anti-cheat. They have a legacy of showing that they don't care, yet suddenly they're pulling this incredibly unpopular stunt with contract mobiles in the name of tackling cheating, an issue that in every other regard they have never ever given more than half a toss about. Anti-cheat does not cut it as a justification. Protecting the player experience? Untrue? Don't you want to police the player experience in regards to the player profiling and the in-game sales environment? Seriously think about it, these guys leave broken shit in games for their entire life cycle. They fail to fix things that ruin the player experience and claim that budget constraints limit what they can do. These guys won't even pull their trousers down to take a shit unless there's money in it. So if they're doing backflips about SMS protect and defense matrix, I don't think it's unwise to assume that there must be a financial angle here because they don't lift a finger unless there is a valid business case justifying the budget. And it isn't anti-cheat, and it's certainly not our feelings. They seem to be prepared to potentially take financial hits on two video game launches, just to get this system implemented. 
there has to be a financial angle. This is not about the player experience in the way that we think of the player experience. Ergo, having a pleasant time playing a video game. The proof of that is Denuvo, a system that got rolled out to stop anti-cheat, but turned out to be a system-crushing bit of software that inserts itself at the kernel level, completely breaks certain games, makes others unplayable, and turns out really to be primarily anti-piracy software. If you have an Alder Lake CPU, you will be painfully aware of the compatibility issues, stuttering problems, performance problems, and most significantly, how Denuvo broke over 90 games on PC. Not kidding, Denuvo looked at some aspect of multi-threading apparently and said, that's cheating, flagged the user as a cheat, bombed the game out to desktop. Obviously, because the player experience is apparently vastly more important than anti-piracy and profits, right? You would assume that they immediately removed Denuvo from every affected game. In some fantasy dimension full of unicorns, pixies and fairies. In this dimension that we refer to as the real world, not only did they not remove it from affected games, they continued to roll it out with new games, knowingly breaking some of them too. So any rhetoric that video game publishers prioritise player experience, customer service and their players' well-being over profits is exactly that. It's rhetoric. Because these guys will roll out anti-piracy software that literally makes the game not work. They will continue to do it, casually wait six months to a year, for a semi-operable patch, and they will refuse your request for a refund just for good measure. Because profits always trump every other imperative. Ban evasion. Any claim that this is about stopping people starting new accounts is tenuous at best. It's very tempting to take this one at face value. Cheaters and people who get banned can just start another account and be back online within minutes. Well, yes, they can theoretically, but it is easily stopped and you don't need a phone number to do that. Since the days of yore, back when computers were made of carved oak and powered by the finest medieval hamsters, this old chestnut has been well and truly cracked. Look, even back in the early days of Punkbuster anti-cheat, the anti-cheat software would do a couple of basic things when you logged on to, say, a Battlefield server. It would take your IP address. It would take a note of your GPU serial number. It would take a note of your CPU serial number. It would look at your PC setup. This shit is as old as the Ark and has been stopping repeat offenders since back in the days of Pentium processors, decent swearing on voice comms, and people thinking Todd Howard wasn't a fucking gaslighter. You do not need someone's contract telephone number to ID repeat offenders. Unless, of course, they're buying a new GPU and CPU every time they get caught. Sure, they might be using computers in an internet cafe. An internet cafe with an IP address. Which will also show up if a group of electronic sweatshop workers are operating at that location. And before anyone says they might use a VPN, well, if you have an issue with a group of cheaters and they're all typing in chat in fucking Cantonese, and they're all playing from the same IP address in fucking Panama, you might, you just might spot a clue that something is slightly moody about that setup. This shit is very easy to spot, and believe it or not, I used to know a guy who volunteered to admin this shit on Battlefield servers, and that should be a red flag right there. Volunteered. Back in the day when this system was rolled out, the publishers were very happy to make the profits on the game, but the anti-cheat was mostly policed at ground level, by volunteers, by people like PB bands. Yeah, volunteers. Even then, there was a system that worked, and the publishers wouldn't pay the bill, and that is a theme with this whole debate. There are ways to achieve the goals the publishers claim to be pursuing, but they cost money that they are not prepared to spend. So instead, we get a dose of bullshit. This system, and a promise that it's all for the best interests of the players. Don't take my word for the fact it's a lie. 
It doesn't even make coherent, logical sense. As for account security, well, that's not a justification either. Two-factor authentication. Authenticators. Pay-as-you-go mobile phones. They work just fine. The aforementioned CPU and GPU checks. I mean, Christ, Blizzard themselves have been selling little plastic authenticators for years. Many large corporations use them. There is zero justification for claiming that they must have people's contract mobile phone numbers for account security. There are some companies that don't use mobile phones for security precisely because of the associated problems with that. Now, video game publishers lie, gaslight and misrepresent the truth all the time. They are habitual bullshitters. It's their job in a way. But it is not inconceivable, given the world we are living in right now, that they are trying to stop legitimate threats and they're only lying about why they're using SMS Protect. Perhaps hackers from hostile states are trying to disrupt gameplay. Perhaps there's some organised industrial espionage being conducted by foreign powers. Perhaps there is some legitimate attempt to protect their online services and they're trying to be covert about what they're really doing about it. But I think it's just more likely that they are devious scheming scumlords and I say this for several reasons. If they are genuinely trying to protect the online experience from hacking groups, well that's not our problem. That should be part of their business operation. The burden of responsibility should not be pushed onto the consumer and this still does not justify them establishing some kind of online gaming passport database with social control and player surveillance. Because if this is about foreign actors attacking the game's security, what has surveillance got to do with it? How many foreign language speakers do you think Activision is going to be hiring for policing chat? They're not going to be hiring anyone to police this shit. Secondly, if they are genuinely shitting the bed that they're being constantly attacked by hackers, this is precisely the reason why they should not be amassing our personal data. Our mobile phone details and communications data does not stop foreign hackers from operating. And more importantly, if they are a legitimate target, we should be giving Activision Blizzard less personal information rather than more. It's like a bank knowing that there's going to be a bank robbery and demanding that all the customers turn up and deposit all of their cash. It's just not good security practice. This is not about protecting the players because a significant proportion will be thrown under the bus 9am day one if having a contract mobile phone is a prerequisite to logging into their games. Creating a player database of real personal identification data does not solve cheating in the absence of actual decent working anti-cheat, which is something they don't do properly because they don't care. So why do they need all this personal info and permission to run a surveillance operation to catch cheaters they can't catch because they haven't actually really rolled out any decent fucking anti-cheat? There simply is not a case to support the claims as they are making them. At best, the most sympathetic thing you can say is that they're not prepared to do the work or spend the money to stop cheating and their response instead is to push the responsibility, data risks and privacy consequences onto the players instead to create a system that people can bypass anyway that gathers all of your data and doesn't actually stop cheating. If there is a way to make this make sense, I'm fucked if I can see it. Their justification is not even internally consistent. Setting aside the implausible justifications for each individual case, their own claims are internally inconsistent. Basically, they're saying we are going to demand details of contract mobile phone numbers in order to, amongst other things, improve the player experience. Their justification is incompatible with their desired goal. Now, it's hard to find exact statistics for a number of reasons, but by my remedial estimates here in the UK, about a third of people have pay-as-you-go phones and two-thirds have contract mobiles. The exact proportions are hard for me to work out for several reasons. First, it's not consistent across age ranges. From what I gather, the sort of demographic of active gamers is more likely to have a pay-as-you-go phone. Similarly, the proportion of pay-as-you-go versus contract is complicated because some people 
have more than one phone. Some people have a pay-as-you-go and a contract phone. You know, a grown-up contract phone for grown-up stuff and a burner phone for buying weed and hooking up with prostitutes behind your wife's back. Or husband. I'm not sexist. Compound this with people who have personal phones and work phones. And these statistics differ across the different age ranges. Look, my statistics are approximate because the stats are fucking balked. There are apparently 85 million contract mobile phones in the UK, which is kind of fucking interesting because there's only 67 million people. And out of those, I'm not convinced that many kids are walking around with contract phones. So why will ballpark it and say approximately one quarter to a half of gamers use a pay-as-you-go phone? So Activision are basically saying they want to improve the player experience by banning one quarter to a half of them from even being able to launch the fucking game. Well, good luck selling that bullshit. They want to stop cheating and protect the player from having their experience disrupted by introducing a system that factually does not do a damn thing to catch cheats, creates a covert player base, records your voice comms in order to profile you, and they want to throw a huge chunk of the player base under the fucking bus. I'm not convinced that this is a very coherent strategy, and it certainly makes for a shit mission statement. We want to make everything better for players by excluding many of them, particularly the poorer players, who we don't want playing at all. And the ones that do play, well, we're going to open up a surveillance profile on you and record all the shit that you say online. Really? What are they going to ask for next? Your biometric data? A credit report? And a fucking stool sample? Because I'm happy to give these guys a stool sample. Don't you worry. This is a video game. There is no logical or legal necessity for us to provide any personal details beyond that which we need to supply to recover a stolen account. And that's not necessarily a requirement. They have no right to be demanding our legal identity and verifying that against a mobile phone contract. A wise man once said, don't listen to what people say, watch what they do. And I think that is a phrase that perfectly applies here. Publishers do things without being transparent, their explanations are frequently untrue, and we are left to try and figure out what is going on behind the curtain, and work out what the whole thing is really about. So what do we know? Well, I think we've established that publishers care less about anti-cheat than they do about child gambling, mental health concerns, and the integrity of their own staff. We know that historically all in-game protection and censorship has almost universally been ideologically driven, and largely comes down to banning lots of words and phrases, critical of or inconsistent with, certain aspects of progressive ideology, whilst allowing all kinds of crazy shit if it's a term associated with wokeness. To distill this into the most simple and pure form, in Call of Duty World War Woke, white power was banned, black power was not. An admittedly juvenile example, but a clear and simple one. Now I'm not going to lose any sleep about the phrase white power being banned, but the point is that this is all justified by end user license agreements, policy statements and e-game rules that constantly bang on about a zero tolerance policy on making any political statements. But the reality as it plays out on the ground is certain politics are banned, other politics are not. They are actually being actively promoted. Name one esports player that's been banned for promoting equity, Black Lives Matter, or transgender rights. I guess that is no longer considered politics, unless of course you hold a different opinion, an opinion which is probably now banned. You can't even write the word Trump in chat in many video games now, and if you criticise Hong Kong, your career in esports will be over within 24 hours. Although on an optimistic note, I'm sure they will ease off with that role once China invades Taiwan and World War 3 kicks off. Every nuclear mushroom cloud has a silver lining, I guess. I make no judgement on nor advocate for any particular set of political views or ideologies. I just think that the treatment of politics and appropriate behaviour and language 
is currently in a state of extreme ultra hypocrisy. Everything is either arbitrarily being given a hall pass or declared hate speech. And that's not what the rules state. If the end user license agreement says no politics, why did I get a message about BLM one time I logged into Call of Duty? What the fuck is that hypocrisy about? I am merely stating that when video game publishers do their censoring, banning and word blocking, it is not a neutral affair. It's not ideologically fair and it is not unbiased. They are trying to curate a game environment with a particular ideological narrative and for want of a better way to describe it, it's fucking ultra woke, progressively left wing, pushing the LGBTQ plus agenda and crushing free speech. And now they want to fire up voice recognition, player data profiles and link it to our legal identities. Fuck that for a game of soldiers. I don't trust these guys enough. I don't trust them at all. And we shouldn't be expected to, just to play an invariably underwhelming video game. We also know that corporations don't really care about the politics. This is marketing. The safe and protected environment is really about curating a certain safe space and pushing out a certain type of player to make it more conducive for marketing. This is ultimately about money, in-game purchases, community control, and specifically taking very good care of whales. That 1% of the players who spend nearly all of the money. The sorts of people that drop thousands of pounds on loot boxes and in-game cosmetic items. This might sound crazy to you, but a tiny fraction of players run up vast bills into many, many thousands of dollars. And those guys are the golden goose for AAA video game publishers. The rest of us are peasants, just getting in the way. We are, fiscally speaking, an annoyance. Frankly, the rest of us can fuck off, especially with free-to-play games. And in no small way, I think this whole mobile phone database is the beginning of an effective video game social credit score, so they can achieve this exact goal. I think they want to identify the whales and cater to them, and identify everyone who might negatively impact on their safe space, demotivate those guys until they leave, or just remove them from the game altogether. I think they want to install the architecture where they can look up a player's profile and say, that guy bought the game and then didn't spend any more money, he complains a lot about bugs in the game, and one time he said our game was woke. Let's downgrade his status to F-, and then let the algorithms keep sticking him in shit lobbies until he eventually gives up and stops playing. Or even worse, you piss off a community manager and they just go to your player profile, make some fake accusation about harassment, hate speech or threats, which is now permanently on your player passport. Being forced to supply your mobile phone details, which are contractually linked to you in real life, is highly problematic. If people want to divulge that information for convenience or security, well, good for them. It's not a sensible thing to do, but go ahead. After all, it's all worked out so well for all the people I know that have been doxxed by renegade tech employees. And let's not forget the security issues that come to light with Twitter. It turned out that at one point, apparently 200 employees somehow had complete security access to every damn account on the platform. Yeah, think about that. Virtually anyone at head office could look up anyone's private data and then email it off to some angry activist, which they did routinely. Allegedly. Being forced to divulge this much information is overreach on so many levels. Firstly, a company like Activision will have zero problem tracing your identity with that info, with or without a court order or warrant. There are paid services online where you can look this shit up. For all we know, Activision has already got some automated system in place to verify your legal identity. They can probably subcontract it out for 5 cents per inquiry. I think it costs 50 cents per inquiry if I do it right now online. You just type the phone number in and press go. Not to mention that depending on who you give your information to, it can represent a potentially catastrophic security risk. Think about it. If you are 100% honest about your details and give them all the information completely, honestly and accurately when requested, 
and as required under Ubisoft's new end user license agreements, during your time registered and playing Activision Blizzard games, you will most likely end up providing them with the following data. Your full name, your email details, your home address, your contract mobile phone number, your date of birth, and most likely your credit card and bank details. Seriously, dear God, I hope that nobody goes into AAA publishers' websites, logged in, and fills in their real date of birth for the age verification required to watch a video. Because if you are, you are really hemorrhaging your personal details. These guys will have as much information on you as your fucking bank, only with a fraction of the security and data protection infrastructure in place. Anyone else think this is an unacceptable situation? I do. This is the company that has just about managed not to piss its secret data into the wind for, um, let me see, nearly a whole 14 months straight without fucking it up. Their security credentials are less than stellar. Five minutes on Google will show you that nearly all video game publishers routinely hemorrhage private data as part of their standard operating procedure. These guys are incompetent fucks when it comes to keeping a secret. Only now, they also want to record your personal conversations, make little databases about whether or not you're a good person or whether you engage in their definition of hate speech, and they reserve the right to share their opinions about you, fair or not, with external agencies and third parties. It's actually quite chilling that we spend so much time using VPNs and online security, and now they want us to hand over all the info without so much as a warrant or a fucking suck job. Clearly, there is a financial dimension to this. They want contract phones, not pay-as-you-go phones, or your sister's phone, all of which will work perfectly fine. They're only interested in people who can afford their own mobile phone contract, which I assume requires passing a credit check. Hmm, I wonder what that could be about. They're frankly happy to throw a significant proportion of the player base under the fucking bus and just cater to the statistically more wealthy proportion of gamers, in their eyes at least. Phone contract good, credit check good, prepaid phone bad. Well, we can say right off the bat this is nothing to do with player security. This is entirely vendor side utility. Sure, I appreciate the assertion that people can use non contract phones to sidestep security lockouts. But there are other established methods to achieve the same goal. Methods that don't require a phone contract and a legal self-disclosure. There is the critical issue here of credit rating. Now personally I have a contract phone and a prepaid burner phone for making anonymous creeper calls, signing up to insanely freakish paid porn sites and sending pictures of my dirty underwear to the woman who works in the shop across the street. Because I can see her with my telescope and watching her reaction is fucking hilarious. But as a general rule, Contract phones are subject to credit checks, ago taken as a mean average, generally speaking we can say that most people on mobile phone contracts can or have passed a credit check, ergo are more likely to own credit cards. What do these Activision games have in common? They have highly tailored in-game stores where they profile players, manipulate the player experience, push them, cajole them and incentivize them to buy shit with their credit cards. Well that might just be a fucking clue about what's really going on here. This is most likely about one general imperative, creating a database of player profiles which they can link to a person and not an account. This is about psyops, sales, profiling and profit. And it comes with the added bonus of providing a mechanism to drum out malcontents like me who complain about their shit on the official forums and won't buy their shoddy loot boxes. It's like a really, really exclusive jewellery store where they have to buzz you in through a security door. And if you look too scruffy, you won't be allowed to enter. Where the preferred customers pay over the top prices for fake diamond watches and worthless tat. And now I've said it, that right there might well be the future of AAA gaming that many publishers are dreaming about. There are some potentially horrific social engineering possibilities for the gaming community here. Reading the official Overwatch 2 blog was somewhat alarming. 
It frankly reads like a bunch of second year gender studies students trying to formulate a policy statement on how to turn the university cafeteria into a non-binary safe space. They didn't quite use the phrase safe space or triggering, but almost, and I mean literally juggled the words around a bit so safe and space were not next to each other and in the right order. Overwatch is a social game with many in-game spaces where players interact. <laughs> Just say safe space and get it over with love. If a player is caught engaging in disruptive behaviour, their account may be banned. And as always, the definition of disruptive is left wide open to mean pretty much anything. We analyse new player skill levels to optimise matchmaking in a way that feels good to everyone. Okay, so it's skill based matchmaking. Fuck that. Basically, they want to give the new player an easy time until they get emotionally invested in the game at the expense of the players who are bothered to get better. Obviously, I don't include myself in that latter category. Defence Matrix encompasses our infrastructure of systems designed to help protect the integrity of gameplay and promote positive behaviour. Jesus. This is starting to sound like Brave New World. They're removing general chat in the game, because we found it to be an area where frequent disruptive behaviour occurred. No talking in the hallways, kids. No, seriously, think about that. Effectively, this policy is silence. No speaking to each other. We can't be bothered to deal with it. We don't want players speaking to each other. So let's just get rid of the communal global chat channel altogether. No speaking in the communal areas? Jails have more relaxed rules than that. They're removing the player portrait borders that show how awesome you are because we found this to be a pain point for competitive play as some players were passing judgement on their teammates before the match began, causing either explicit or implicit bias to occur immediately. Pain points? Implicit bias? Basically, people are being prejudiced about shit players because they're shit. Well, we can't have that. Reality is bad. Enabling players who are both positive and constructive to be the leading voices in the community. Okay, this is getting chilling. They're going to actively manipulate the player comms and forum presence in some nefarious way so that the shiny happy people get heard more and one can logically only conclude that negative comments and criticism will get heard less. Well, what is wrong with the old fashioned way of doing it? Make a great game so people are happy and say happy things. It's much better and simpler than focusing on manipulating all communication channels so that people who might have a damn good reason to be pissed off get suppressed and silenced. But here was a particularly scary and perhaps very significant Freudian slip. In the key set of goals they state they want to create a safer community both in and out of the game. Now why in fuck's name would they think that their purview extends to policing player conduct outside of the damn game? And that one statement alone should be ringing massive alarm bells concerning why these officious social justice hall monitors want our contract phone account details in order to individually identify our legal identities. The most generous interpretation of this statement is that they are extending the remit of defence matrix to policing conduct outside of the game to include off-platform activities. I guess such as forums, the subreddit, possibly even social media activity. Now, that is the generous interpretation, and even this is fucked up. Let's not forget that YouTube rolled out a similar policy not long ago, and they have said that they will, and have, banned lots of YouTubers for things they have allegedly done off-platform. I mean, Jesus Christ, we're trying to play a fucking video game here, it's not like we're applying for a job in the civil service. This entire SMS Protect and Defence Matrix is clearly part of some larger coordinated initiative to micromanage the player experience and weed out people who frankly don't want to play nice with the politically correct agenda. For years, 
Our team has used machine learning to detect and prevent disruptive behavior, cheating, and disruptive text chat. Our detection methods leverage multiple systems, including your in-game reports, to identify behavior that drives down the quality of the in-game experience. Now that is an interesting statement. For a start, they're conceding that they handle a lot of complaints and player management with bots. We all know how well that usually works out. But based on my personal experiences, I'm also going to assume that really what they mean is stupid shit AI bots that spontaneously ban you from in-game chat for several hours for zero fucking reason. Or how that time suddenly everything I said in chat got censored out with asterisks for no fucking reason. And that one occasion where I couldn't even say GG without the word being censored. Just GG. I could type anything else that I wanted. Makes total sense. The broke reality remains that thus far Activision's efforts have resulted in this. Every single phrase or word even remotely associated with swearing, profanity, anti-woke sentiment or criticising the message has been banned in chat and even your loadout screens for years. So it's not like you can really say much that's offensive anyway. Oh, and about one third of Call of Duty players cheat and use hacks, which represents a year on year rise. So I am genuinely curious why they would wax lyrical about their legacy of using machine learning to police their video games, because thus far, all it has achieved is this. Every single remotely controversial phrase is banned in chat. Lots of completely benign words are banned from everywhere. Cheating is at an all time high. So whatever the fuck these bots are doing, it clearly has nothing to do with stopping cheaters or genuine harassment. Especially since most of the language censorship only seems to work in English. Seriously, I know just about enough French and German to see when someone is making comments about fucking my mum or some other interesting insult that I recognize from films about World War II. You know what I'm talking about. Then, nestled into the small print of the Defence Matrix Task Force section, I found it. It literally is a fucking safe space strategy. It turns out Activision Blizzard are founding members of an organisation called the Fair Play Alliance, which boasts that every player deserves a fair, safe and inclusive space to play. Almost said safe space. A global coalition that empowers people in the games industry to share best practices, knowledge and tools to create fair and inclusive spaces in gaming. Safe spaces, empowerment, how incredibly stunning and brave. But personally, I'm more worried about the fact that they openly talk about sharing methods and knowledge because that's not quite saying sharing information and player accounts, but almost. I spent some time on their website and most of their guff and press releases read like a social welfare report, written by one of those gullible shit social workers that would keep defending that psycho kid at school by blaming society, claiming that society made him how he is, until little psycho boy eventually punched her in the fucking mouth and then burnt down the school. <laughs> then he got a custodial sentence that he deserved. It's all about feelings and emotional states and making online games an inclusive snowflake friendly online unicorn riding fucking cringe fest. If the policy statements of the Fair Play Rainbow Alliance is anything to go by, this whole strategy isn't about anti-cheat and stopping genuine abuse, it's about onboarding critical race theory into video game communities and policing non-compliant players completely out of the gaming space using, amongst other things, player profiling. This is not this. Fucking dirty hacker. Shit stain. Literal shit stain. Level 21. Look at him, look at him, looking at me through the wall, and then... 26 kills. Would love for this guy to get banned somehow. Like, right now. Uh, right oh, now. Man. You need to, you, you need to, message Tim. Message Whips. I'm gonna message Whips. I'm gonna message Whips, see if we can get a ban live. Get, get him out of here. This is actually this. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to the White House to speak to the President of the United States! Huh. You know that phrase, I fear I may have girl boss too close to the sun? Well, that's how I feel today. 
My one takeaway from all of this is that this is not the sort of power that we should be casually handing over to the sorts of rat fucks and shit weasels that run video game publishers. We are talking about the kinds of people who try and turn children into gambling addicts and threaten to have people assassinated while showing up in Jeffrey Epstein's personal black book. These are not good people who hold our welfare dear to their hearts. And power is the key word here. It's not just about the intended abuses of having a singular anchor onto which to hang the many hundreds of data points they are compiling on you as a person. With singular online gaming identities, they have the power to take everything away. Remember that this entire project is part of an embryonic collaboration through an intermediary company working across multiple publishers, right across the industry, with the self-proclaimed goal of making gaming a fucking giant woke safe space. So what are they going to be doing with people like me? Life banning me? Or sending me to political re-education classes? Because I'm frankly very curious how they intend to make non-compliant people like me conform to this political agenda. I already know people who have unfairly lost entire video game accounts unjustly. One friend told someone to fuck off over voice comms after they had sworn at him first. Turns out the other guy works for Xbox. And he took great delight in banning his entire Xbox account and mocking him, costing him every game he'd ever bought. No appeal, no oversight. This is like hiring barely trained, barely employable minimum wage security guards and conferring on them all the powers and authority of a US Marshal. Too much power, zero accountability, and thus far not a single reference to oversight. I know lots of incidents like this where one infraction, fair or not, true or not, without appeal, results in the company essentially deplatforming someone of all the games they had that came under that company's launcher and account. Well, if you think that is bad, imagine what happens when these crazy fascist fucks get to the point where this defence matrix, or some descendant of this Skynet cross-platform, cross-publisher initiative, gets finished. Imagine that. Imagine a situation where this little woke company has its industry-wide database of real player identities and they're all inputting information into it in real time via bots and they can all extract data from it at will. If you think losing your Xbox account is bad, imagine what could happen if some woke blue-haired trans activist decides you're a neo-Nazi because you misgendered an NPC jump on their little defence matrix terminal login and flag you up as a sexual harasser and potential domestic terrorist. Imagine being banned from all compliant game publishers in an instant, with no right to appeal, no legal recourse that you can afford and nothing you can do about it. Well now imagine this. Many employers, and certainly employers like the police, government and other institutions who vet your background already routinely require people to submit details of their social media history for vetting purposes. Many people have been refused jobs or thrown out of jobs because of one random tweet they made when they were a teenager. If they get this gaming database off the ground, it's not going to be long before people like the police are going to be demanding to see it during job applications and court cases, just like they demand access to people's social media accounts and text messages and emails right now. Imagine being blacklisted from your career as a doctor because someone found out that you called another player a fucking poof five years earlier and now you are flagged as a homophobe. Do you really want a situation where one woke intersectional feminazi random idiot working on minimum wage can come back from her lunch break in a piss where she's been protesting for more bail reform, bought some free crack for a hobo and then because she doesn't like your Trump avatar or your pro 2A Twitter bio, decides to concoct a completely spurious complaint against you by flagging your account as potential mass shooter. This kind of database will have zero accountability, but once it exists, people will certainly still want to look at it. You should be allowed to be anonymous when playing a video game. Why the fuck are we sleepwalking into a situation where you might have to consider breaking the law to create a false identity so you can get a mobile phone contract under a different name so you can play your favourite video game which you were banned for for no reason. Or just so that you can play anonymously. We really have to be vocal 
active and principled about taking a stand about the shit show that is happening in big tech right now. We have a situation where video game publishers are colluding with the media. Video game corporations are colluding with search engines and YouTube. YouTube video game reviewers are colluding with video game publishers. And fucking review sites are colluding with anyone who pays them money. Everyone is fucking colluding with everyone to completely micromanage your online perception of video games. And unless we are very careful, soon they're going to be micromanaging the online perception of you. What I'm about to say might initially sound absurd, but governments are currently trying to end online anonymity and roll out electronic digital passports for other activities like social media sites and watching porn. As insane as this sounds, there is no shortage of politicians who would like to see people dox themselves just to make a post on Twitter and have that requirement hard baked into law. I'm genuinely concerned that this dick move from Activision Blizzard might be the precursor or foundation of a social credit score type system in video games, or at the very least, the precursor to an online video game digital passport system. Gradually, they have been moving the pieces into position, making small changes to end user license agreements, removing our privacy, accessing more of our data. And this might be the moment where we have to decide if we're going to go quietly into the night. They get us to sign onerous legal agreements. They take away our consumer rights. They deploy lawyers to sue people out of existence. They ban people from games without appeal or legal recourse. And now, now they want to do all of this whilst getting you to attach your real legal identity to your online video game presence. Fuck these guys. Would you post your real name, home address and phone number on your Twitter bio? We are one step away from having persistent online video game identities that carry over from one game to the next and from one publisher to the next. Always be sceptical of the video game industry propaganda, because whenever they do something shitty, they come up with some euphemistic description of the act. That's what all despots do. But make no mistake, either in this iteration or the next, SMS Protect combined with Defense Matrix is about a few simple things that have nothing to do with your best interest or player experience. It's about creating a persistent online video game passport. It's about data harvesting. And it's about combining these two initiatives in order to manipulate you, get your money, and to throw you out of the gaming world if you are considered to be a bad citizen. They had any integrity at all, they would have at least admitted that they were sinister fucks and renamed the initiative the Video Game Social Credit System. But for now, good luck and happy hunting. Have yourself a nice trip.